Hey, Jorio here, and if you're watching this, then you've probably heard the unfortunate news that Bleeding Edge will cease development to focus on other Ninja Theory projects. And that sucks. Bleeding Edge had a lot going for it, and it's unfortunate that it would no longer be supported. There were so many changes people wanted to see in this unique game, and now we will never see them come to light. I know people have a lot of questions and are understandably upset about this news. I've been playing the game and making content for a long time, so I wanted to make my own postmortem and share it so people can maybe find solace and understand why the game ended up the way it did. These problems start way before the game came out and it's important to understand them to get the big picture. The beginning is all conjecture. Unless you're a part of the company, it's difficult to know if a lot of things are true. But if the rumors are right, Bleeding Edge started development in 2016. They made a prototype for the game, which is apparently this, but no publisher would take the idea. They continued development on the game with a small team over the years as a passion project of Rennie Tucker. But in 2018, Ninja Theory was acquired by Microsoft, among other companies in recent years. One of the major reasons Microsoft was doing this was to get games on Game Pass. It was their main priority at the moment. And Microsoft apparently agreed to keep Ninja theories create a freedom, so we can assume that development went on as normal for Bleeding Edge. Fast forward to E3 2019 and the game is officially announced. There's a lot of excitement around it. Fans are comparing it to Gigantic, Anarchy Reigns, among other titles. But after this announcement, we run into some pre-release problems that would lead to Bleeding Edge having poor launch numbers. I'm not a marketing expert, but to a lot of people, Bleeding Edge did not receive the marketing a multiplayer game like it would need to prosper. I think it's important to look at both sides though. Bleeding Edge did do some marketing, as much as you might expect from a small company. They hired a Rex Gaming to do sponsored guides and all the characters, they did a few interviews, they had an active Twitter and Instagram account during Bleeding Edge's beta, and many big content creators also covered or streamed the game. XQC, Mr. Fruit, Sir Swag, Jim Sterling, and Skillup to name a few. This is about all a small developer like Ninja Theory can do. There was definitely more that could have been done on their end that did not cost money, but what's strange was that money was even a problem. They'd been acquired by Microsoft and Booting Edge was going to be featured on Xbox Game Pass. So why wasn't there more marketing to push this title into the spotlight? Microsoft has money, so it's really weird we did not get more marketing from Bleeding Edge like Twitch or YouTube advertisements. Regardless, this was definitely a factor that led to Bleeding Edge's low launch numbers. The other important factor in Bleeding Edge's poor launch was its release date. The date of release would be March 24th, right next to the release of two extremely popular game series, Doom Eternal and Animal Crossing, and close by FF7 Remake and Ori. Releasing next to these games as a new IP was suicide. More people were interested in playing these new, heavily hyped titles over Bleeding Edge. The decision to release the game at this point was objectively problematic, and I have to assume something went on behind the scenes to force this release because no one releasing a new IP would launch their new game next to not one, but two industry giants. These two problems combined to hinder the launch of Bleeding Edge in a very profound way, but this is not where the problem stop. Next, we have to talk about launch. The game was free on Xbox Game Pass, but it costed $30 everywhere else. Usually multiplayer games like this launch is free to play, and a lot of people wanted it that way. When I was at E3 last year, I had the chance to interview the creative director, Rani Tucker, and the first thing I said to her was, you've got a great game here, but it has to be free to play. But with no microtransactions of any kind, there was probably no other way to make money on launch, and Microsoft probably would not let them go free to play because it would devalue its presence on on Game Pass. There were a lot of changes between the technical alpha and the beta, but there arguably weren't enough from beta to launch. To a lot of people, this game was not ready for release, and that was very apparent upon launch. Bleeding Edge launch was marred with performance issues and significant lag between players. These performance issues were especially prevalent on the Xbox One where owners of the original Xbox One were playing a version of the game that was lower than the lowest settings on PC, with lots of attacks having missing or neutered effects. For a lot of people, this was completely unplayable. What is going on here? Dude, it is not my computer. With frequent frame drops into the single digits and players teleporting all over the map. Couple this with the lag and you have a very unplayable environment for some. The abundant lag would also give rise to the infamous death glitch where the game would roll back a kill or death if it wasn't actually supposed to happen. 
Yeah. Dude, it feels good to kill somebody. Wait, what? This could be very disorienting and frustrating. Suffice it to say, this wasn't a good look for launch. They did try to fix this by improving the netcode and limiting the ping between players. While this was not a terrible idea, it caused a lot of people living in places like the Oceania region to no longer be able to find games and no longer to be allowed to play with their friends from other countries, effectively killing some people's ability to play. This obviously made many players drop the game entirely, but Bleeding Edge faced even more problems on the launch with the lack of content. Bleeding Edge launched with no skins outside of pre-order skins and recolors, so there wasn't much to grind for outside of hoverboards. But the accumulation was extremely slow and there was nothing else to retain players. There was no ranked match, no leaderboards, no custom games, no dailies, and no battle pass. There wasn't even a way to pick which mode you wanted to play in the casual queue, so if you didn't like one of the modes, you were out of luck there wasn't a lot of reason to keep playing the game after you had gotten your fill. There was no one playing competitively either because of no ranked and customs, meaning the best you could do was play and try to have fun, which isn't a great way to retain players. And most ended up leaving very quickly, hoping for subsequent updates to add more to the game. This will be a continuous problem throughout Bleeding Edge's lifespan, but still more problems would plague the game. One major example being quitters. There's no lockout penalty for leaving a Bleeding Edge game, so people would end up quitting games for any reason they might come up with. Some people quit so often you'd think it was a part of their lifestyle. Yo! My... God! He won one. Oh, oh. oh how many games has he played? What did it say? Only eight. So what? He's played sixty six games. 66 games and he's only won three and it wasn't abnormal this made a few distinct problems one people would leave at the drop of a hat making the games imbalanced and unfun two people would end up backfilling those games sometimes backfilling into an instant loss three and because there was no competitive outlet four stacks would play randoms all day and completely stomp them well-known four stacks were avoided like the plague and it's understandable nobody wants to duo into an unfun loss. In one patch, they would take away the ability to gain currency if you left mid-game, and would specifically look for games to backfill you into for three games. But this did not deter people from leaving how they saw fit. This led to problems, especially later in the game's lifespan, where people would end up backfilling into losing games over and over again, having more backfills than normal games. The only way to avoid this was to join your own stack, which would make more people quit because of the unfair odds, which would lead to solo players backfilling those spots, and so oh. the cycle continues. Oh, this is gonna be tough. Yeah. I might just quit, Everyone to be honest. Quit. Everyone quit, yeah. yeah just quit. Quit. You don't get a loss. Now we move on to the gameplay problems. What a lot of people expected from Bleeding Edge and what it turned out to be were very different. You could chalk this up to marketing, but also player expectations. Bleeding Edge was a cross of third person action game elements and MOBA elements. Bleeding Edge even started as a MOBA before changing into what it is now. It's interesting because Bleeding Edge had its roots more in like a MOBA. Uh, so we started off with kind of towers and minions and lanes and, and this type of thing. But we found as we played, the game sort of told us what it wanted to be and it, it sort of led us away from that because it was hard to hold kind of that level of strategy in your head at the same time as playing in third person. Some people, myself included, expected something close to Anarchy Reigns or its cousin genre, Arena Fighter. But this was not the case at all. 
If you've never played Anarchy or an Arena Fighter, you might think Bleeding Edge is something similar, but they're actually very different. Anarchy is a combination of action games and fighting games, with an emphasis on neutral play, blocking, skill-based dodging, combos, mix-up, spacing, all the things you would expect from a third-person fighter or arena fighter. And Bleeding Edge, well, it did not have any of this. There's only one attack button, dodging is on a stamina bar like Gigantic, and the game is entirely ability based. Some characters becoming pretty much useless after their abilities are over. Instead of outplaying your opponents in neutral, you're trying to rotate your team's abilities to best deal with your opponents, like a MOBA. Ranged characters in Arena Fighters are an expression of the melee combat system, but in Bleeding Edge, most ranged characters are literally turrets, just trying to hold down the fire button with very little interactivity. This isn't a bad thing, it's just not what some people expected the game to play like, and it turned a lot of players off. This also happened on the other end of the spectrum. Because some of Bleeding Edge's gameplay is based on third-person action games, it has lock-on combat, including ranged attacks. If you've played Devil May Cry, you'll know Dante does not aim his guns, he locks on to shoot the target automatically. This was usually to stay airborne or to combo an enemy. It was not primarily for damage. It was part of a larger moveset. But in Bleeding Edge, it is primarily for damage, and people that came in expecting a hero shooter were very put off by this. People who died to ranged characters felt like they were being killed by a low skill player, and people who used those ranged characters were weren't entertained because they did not feel like they were doing anything skillful. Also talk about the auto aim lock mechanic that this game has. This for me takes away all player skill and again takes away all real control of your character, which was seen by me and Jambu as probably one of the biggest reasons we really dislike this game. The skill in Bleeding Edge ranged combat is nearly entirely about positioning and resource management, but that wasn't enough of a skill test for most people, as described by the many, 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 many posts people made about this game not having aiming. Some people even saying the game was designed for casual console players, which did not help the game's reputation. While the devs did specifically design the skill test for ranged positioning rather than aiming, the low skill ceiling is a valid complaint for why a lot of people left the game. There isn't a lot of outplay potential in most characters' kits, and some of the casts could be mastered in just a few minutes. Maeve is a great example of this. She has three abilities. A cage, a damage dealing siphon, and an invisible, invincible escape. You cage the target, siphon the target, use your escape if you're being pressured, and then just auto attack until the cooldowns are back. That's it. There's basically no room for expression or individuality, and this leads to very unsatisfying gameplay for a lot of people. Combat in Bleeding Edge is entirely about team play. But on the whole, combat essentially asks, are you playing well with your team? Way more than it asks, are you playing well with your character? I think the thing I disliked most about Bleeding Edge was the lack of agency that I had. But Bleeding Edge is at its best when you're playing with a coordinated team. It was just not possible to have these competitive team games, so some players found the majority of their games to be unsatisfying. The last point I want to touch on is the biggest gripe I had with the game that never seemed to resolve itself. There was never a moment I had in Bleeding Edge during the time that I put into the game that felt satisfying to me, win or loss. If your team wasn't coordinated or you had someone who would go off lone wolf style, it's 99% likely that you will lose the match. On the other hand, a well-organized team can trounce the opposition so easily that it probably left many players not wanting to stick around. I got MVP in one match, getting top kills and assists and zero deaths, and at the end, I just wasn't that satisfied with the game that I just played. Now, Bleeding Edge is acutely focused on team-based play. Sticking together is crucial, and that's great if you're with a team that actually does it. Now, rarely have I played this game and felt like the match was competitive. I would say so far maybe one in seven. One in seven matches actually feels like it could go either way, like each team has at least some sort of fighting chance. Typically what happens is one side completely wipes the floor with the other.
The problems of content and player retention on launch needed to be addressed, but they were addressed very slowly. And in that time, significant balance problems plagued the game. In casual play, double heal, using two healers, was an extremely powerful way to play because most uncoordinated squads could not outdamage two healers simultaneously, and healers like Kulev were very easy to play. Even the devs during the community stream almost always used this lineup. And in competitive play, there was basically only one or two viable comps. Competitive play boiled down to CC chains. CCing someone multiple times and trying to kill them as fast as possible. The reason this was the only viable way to play was because of a broken healer named Zero Cool. He could essentially heal you through everything in the game because of his overpowered heal beam, and you could not dive him against a coordinated team because you would be melted immediately due to easy CC chains. It didn't take much playtime before discovering that picking budget Lucio and pressing a single button to deliver unlimited healing made it almost impossible for my pocket to lose a fight. There were a few more problems, but the worst balancing issues would come later with the discovery of Nidhogger's Shredder ability. To sum it up, Nidhogger is a melee tank killer that wants to play close to burn people and heal off hitting burning targets. But with the mod setup leaning towards his Shredder ability, which can be used infinitely, he turned into a ranged AoE and DOT god essentially being able to continuously burn the entire enemy team throughout the team fight. And he could do this through the wall as long as he had sight, meaning nowhere was safe from him and there was no other DPS character you could have. He did the best melee damage, the best range damage, the best AoE damage, had the best CC chains, and had long super armor on all of his abilities. He was completely broken and brain dead. Players despised Shredder and would complain about it often. How overpowered it was, was never fixed appropriately. The second major balancing issue was the character Mecho, who, with the right mods, could put down an infinite puddle that reduced incoming damage by 50%. Granted characters in the puddle, percentage lifesteal, and could enhance it to reduce the healing for the enemy team who was standing within it. With the right team comp, you could stay alive in the puddle on point nearly forever. He and his team simply was not going to die 90% of the time. It was so bad, you could win an entire game without killing anyone. The worst of which being a game that had two deaths total in 11 minutes. Not bad, boy. Zero kills. Anyone who played the game competitively hated the Mecho era of the game. It was so bad, players would have something called a gentleman's agreement where they would not play Mecho against each other. This character was Cancer Incarnate. Hello and welcome to my guide to playing Mecho. First choose puddle size and duration. And then ready up. This is the most difficult part of the solo, so if you've made it this far, congratulations, and you are sure to succeed now. Next, make sure you're hitting as many of the keys on your keyboard as possible, as often as possible. I've found that your face or open hand works best for this. If you have a second monitor like I do, you can also multitask by playing a second game such as Minesweeper to keep you entertained until the match is over. Congratulations, you have now mastered Mecho successfully. But despite all these problems, some people still really enjoyed the game and many thought that if it just got the updates and changes it needed, it would be great. And the most requested feature from players by far was a ranked mode. Bleeding Edge did not launch with ranked or custom, so competitive players were left in the dust along with people who just wanted balanced fun games. Ninja Theory heard the players' requests and responded with with this, we are looking into customs and ranked to see if they have a place in Bleeding Edge. Whether ranked or customs has a place in a competitive team game, where playing as a team with good players is the most fun part of the game. Where being competitive was emphasized over and over in interviews. Because um, it's really important that it's a competitive game, right? We don't want to affect the competitive nature of the game by selling things. Obviously, 
This was not taken well, and for good reason. It was a bad response. After an article surfaced on the Bleeding Edge Discord where Randy Tucker talks about not wanting Bleeding Edge to have a toxic environment, many players assumed this was the real reason that the game did not have ranked, citing one of Randy's final lines. The studio thought it should make Bleeding Edge about being friendly and about being enjoyable and playful. The whole thing's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. It's meant to be fun, right? It's not meant to make people angry. And that's the way I wanted people to feel when they play the game. That's the kind of community that we want to help. Though this might be plausible, it is kind of reaching far for reasons I will explain later. Though the Discord community was handled rather poorly in regards to this statement. Bleeding Edge fan moderators called helpers apparently weren't given a lot of power and had little say in much of anything. The community management is just a little weird though, one of the Bleeding Edge helpers said in a private message. Just like how often people are banned or punished for things and how it's on one hand run by the community mods like me who are not affiliated with Ninja Theory, but then there are the actual people who work for Ninja Theory who I assume moderate. When the official server started, I guess we lost power to do things on our own. We were more like hall monitors rather than moderators. This rings true in some cases, such as moderation often targeting the wrong areas like self-advertisement. In other discords, there's usually a place for community events or content creators to share their streams or videos, but there wasn't a place to self-advertise content or community events in the Bleeding Edge discord. There was a channel specifically only for clips that were under 30 seconds, but some people advertised here anyway and what was removed and not removed was arbitrary. When the first community tournament was organized by players, you weren't even allowed to link to the Discord it was happening in. B, uh, they had created a tournament on June 20th. He so said I created it with Josh. Uh, advertisement wise, um, you know, I tried to post the links in it in the Discord channel. Um, Maybe after that third or fourth like post that I put in the Discord channel, uh, it got deleted uh, by a mod. Don't know who did it, but it got deleted. So uh, I'm assuming that they did not want me to advertise it. Even though a group of developers participated, some people did not even know the tournament happened, saying that it was a private tournament, which could have been avoided had there been a place to advertise community events. This leads to another major complaint from players, which was the lack of communication. The player base feared the death of the game and were eager for consistent communication from the devs, but the Bleeding Edge team would only communicate when they had something to share and never answered questions about what was going on behind the scenes, nor was there two-way communication. The team did listen, but often fell short of what players wanted. When it was time for what would then be Bleeding Edge's final update, they made some problematic balance changes and instead of adding ranked, they added a casual leaderboard. You could still run into four stacks, so the only way for someone to rank high was to group up, which incentivized grouping more than before and led to solo players having a worse experience because on top of running into constant backfills, they would also run into groups trying to rank up way more often, alienating more players. This leaderboard was also easily manipulated to the point that a group of the eight top players wrote messages in the leaderboards and held the top 20 spots at one point in the game's lifespan. These changes would lead to more frustration about the game's direction. You were just like, ah, what, why? What are they doing? They're so close to being good. And then they're just like, you know what? Instead of making our bed, what if we just shit on the ceiling? That's what they're that's what they're doing with their with their fucking developments. I don't get it, Kyle. I don't get it. And after this update, we would have 6 months of nearly no communication until the game was suddenly unceremoniously announced to be no longer supported. So, what happened? 
Now, it's important to know some of these things were out of Ninja Theory's hands. This is a lot of speculation, but it wouldn't be fair if we did not try to look at things objectively. First off, Ninja Theory was an independent studio when they started development on Bleeding Edge and were acquired by Microsoft during development. We had the chance to talk to a Bleeding Edge developer about a concept art image that featured customs despite them not being in the full game. I'm going to keep them anonymous because I don't know if this information will hurt them if it gets back to Ninja Theory, so take this with a grain of salt if you must. Their response was that the initial plan was to have customs in the game, but after the Microsoft acquisition, a lot of changes had to be made for the new infrastructure they were developing for. This was vague, but what this insinuates is that the game was probably not initially designed for Xbox. When one of the devs was asked about customs post-launch, they responded, it's been a lot more difficult than you would think. So customs were in development for a while, maybe for a long time, but something was hindering their development of it. This is not the first time this has happened to a game and certainly not the first with Microsoft. Motiga's hero shooter MOBA Gigantic took a deal with Microsoft for exclusivity, but they then had to port a game made for PC on the consoles, which sucked a lot of development time from them until the deal suddenly fell through. We can also look at the now canceled Scalebound and the speculation that it was creative differences and work environment expectations that had Microsoft and Platinum parting ways. Troubled Microsoft development goes as far back as 10 years where the now defunct Monday Night Combat devs said that it was more difficult getting through Microsoft's certification process, among other problems. Not to mention the now cancelled Phantom Dust remake and um, Halo Infinite. Microsoft and troubled development isn't uncommon these days. When it comes to the release date, Microsoft setting a deadline is a reasonable assumption. And I would not be surprised because big publishers do this all the time. Ubisoft releasing Rayman Origins next to Skyrim and EA releasing Titanfall 2 next to Battlefield and Call of Duty come to mind. This might be the reason why the game did not have ranked on launch. Rennie has played tons of competitive games and new players wanted ranked before the game even came out stating it as a priority, but I assume that getting that as well as customs into the game on time was not possible. And by the time they could, the player base was too small to support it. They also probably knew they would not be able to support Bleeding Edge for as long as they wanted. Also, going free to play would not have been allowed, considering it would have taken away from the game's value on Game Pass. As for communication, developers were consistently active in the alpha version of the game, often guiding players, talking about development, and making unique content the community could consume while the alpha was down. But the sooner we got to release, the less this would occur. We can attribute a lot of this to the pandemic really kicking into gear right as the game came out. Some bleeding edge developers being moved to more important projects like Hellblade, and a lot of developers and senior staff leaving Ninja Theory on launch and post-launch, which would severely impede further development because they are a team of less than 25. The way people view Bleeding Edge might have been different had they handled things like Motiga, who was openly passionate about Gigantic's development until the day the game died. But even here, they might not have been able to communicate. If Microsoft did slight them with marketing, they wouldn't be able to speak openly about it because, well, Microsoft is the publisher and you don't want to ruin your new business relationship. And if there are more problems during development and you had to leave for more important projects, you would not want to damage your reputation as a studio, even if those problems were out of your hands. This feels especially likely because on the day the game was announced to be discontinued, a player close to one of the devs received a private message apologizing for leaving the game in the state that it was. And furthermore, saying that they got together to play the game, but thought against playing in public matches because, quote, we were worried it may not go down too well, and people might be too angry. From this, it's obvious the devs knew about their reputation, but they probably could not say anything because they are most likely under an NDA. I could be wrong about a lot of this, but saying Ninja Theory bad doesn't sum up a complex problem. Realistically, we can say the devs would not be the ones to blame for this. It would be the management. Management has the say in what devs are allowed to work on. The team probably did not choose to abandon Bleeding Edge. It was more likely they were forced onto other more important projects, which you can plainly see on some of the LinkedIn pages of many BE devs. Bleeding Edge was a side project, and it was treated as such by the higher-ups. That's very much a part of Bleeding Edge I think people forget. 
I don't think it was supposed to be a big live service game. It was just a multiplayer passion project, one that has been mistreated and pushed out as quickly as possible and to the side for more ambitious projects. Does this absolve Ninja Theory of all responsibility? No. A consumer cares about the product and the way the product is delivered, and a lot of people found that the product and the way it was handled were not up to their standards. Some things like the balance issues, player engagement, the handling of quitters, and content creators objectively could have been handled better. As a passion project, it's fantastic. It's obvious from the great sound design to the amazing details and animation to the music that I've been playing in the background that this was a showcase of love and talent. Despite the team's size, this was AAA levels of quality. But as a product, it did not meet customer expectations, though a lot of that was probably out of the developer's hands. I hope this has helped you understand why Bleeding Edge might have ended up the way it did. Obviously, the devs wouldn't and probably couldn't tell us about what really happened. There might be a day where we know what exactly transpired, but for now, all we have is speculation. As we do for many, many, many other games the industry has tight lips on. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next one.